today I'm going to talk about spanners. Uh, spanners are basically a way to sparsify a given graph G uh, and generate a graph H that has fewer edges but approximately preserves all the distances in G. So specifically, we'll be talking about multiplicative spanners where the, all the distances are preserved up to a factor of alpha. Uh, this factor alpha is what is referred to as the stretch of the spanner. One way to ensure that this inequality is satisfied uh, for every deleted edge in H uh, is to ensure that for every deleted edge, uh, let's say that uv is an edge that is being deleted, uh, we have some sort of auxiliary path between u and v uh, that makes up for the fact that uv was deleted. So specifically, the weight of this path uh, should be at most alpha times the weight of the original edge. So that's what a spanner is. Uh, now we go to some existential results. Uh, we know that given an integer k, uh, we can always create a spanner with stretch 2k minus 1 that contains n to the 1 plus 1 over k edges. So for example, if k is equal to 1, uh, or sorry, k is equal to 2, uh, we get alpha is equal to 3. Uh, so we get a spanner of stretch 3 with n to the 3 halves edges. This means that any graph can be sparsified down to n to the 3 halves edges while preserving distance up to a factor of 3. Uh, conversely, uh, there exists graphs into the 3 halves edges which cannot be sparsified any further uh, because they don't contain any 4 cycles. Uh, and if, so if you don't contain any 4 cycles, there's no edge that you can delete. Because if there's a 5 cycle, for example, deleting an edge uh, makes it stretch by a factor of 4. We can do this for any value of k up to log n. So at log n, the number of edges becomes O of n, and we can't really sparsify it any further. So now I'll present a simple greedy algorithm to construct a spanner of stretch 2k minus 1. Uh, it's a pretty much the obvious thing you would think of. You start by sorting all the weights in increasing order. For the rest of this talk, we won't really talk about weights, but this is sort of where it comes in. Uh, so you start with increasing order, you start with an empty graph H, and one by one, you check uh, for every edge in increasing order of weight, you check the following condition. So basically, if you are currently considering an edge UI VI, uh, you are just checking whether there already exists a path uh, which makes adding the edge redundant or not. So if adding the edge is redundant, then you don't add it, and if it is necessary because the existing path is too long, then you add the edge. So this is the greedy sequential algorithm. For the rest of this talk, I'll actually focus on the parallel algorithm for this problem. Specifically, I'll be talking about an algorithm of Boswana and Sen. So this is a classical algorithm from 2007. They provide a parallel algorithm with depth of k. So essentially, the depth is equal to the stretch of the spanner. And the algorithm essentially starts with assigning each vertex to be a cluster. And then these clusters uh, both grow and die off. So there's two things that can happen. So specifically, we proceed for k minus 1 iterations. Uh, and in each iteration, some of the existing clusters are subsampled. So let's say we start with these green clusters. Not all of them will proceed to the next round. So only a few of them will be subsampled with probability n to the minus 1 over k, and these are the clusters that will sort of be promoted to the next round. Additionally, uh, each of the sampled clusters increases its radius by one unit in each iteration. Uh, so the unsampled clusters, the green ones, are just forgotten, but everything that is sampled sort of increases radius by one unit. Uh, so initially, you know, each vertex starts as a singleton cluster, and over time, it grows to engulf more and more vertices. So there is also a second phase of this algorithm. So after k minus 1 iterations, let's consider how many clusters are still remaining. So if you look at the sampling probability, after k minus 1 iterations, we see the number of clusters that are still remaining uh, is pretty much exactly n to the 1 over k. The number of vertices remaining is exactly n, and essentially what you do is you join each vertex, each cluster, with one edge. So multiplying out, the number of edges is exactly what we expect, and this is where we can terminate the algorithm. So we won't worry about the second phase for now. Let's focus instead on the subsampling of the growth phases. Subsampling is pretty simple. You just take some probability and subsample vertices. Uh, more interesting is the growth. And in fact, instead of looking at the growth from the viewpoint of the clusters, we'll actually look at it from the viewpoint of a vertex V. So vertex V is adjacent to a bunch of old clusters and let's say potentially one new cluster that's marked in red. We start by removing all the duplicate edges of the cluster. So if you notice that V is adjacent to one of the green clusters with multiple edges, we'll keep only one of them. Um, and I'll explain later why this is okay, but it should be intuitively clear that keeping only one edge is sufficient to maintain stretch. Uh, we also do talk about sort of the internal structure of the clusters, which sort of basically is a rooted tree, uh, but we'll get back to that. Uh, one thing to note is that this is not enough, because you might have many clusters and n vertices, and multiplying the number of vertices with the number of clusters will still result in too many edges. So we should prune the edges further. So we divide into two cases, given a specific vertex v. Uh, we consider the case when v is next to some sample clusters versus when it's not. Note that v can also be part of a sample cluster or not, but that is not what we care about here. We only care about the neighbors. In so in case one, uh, when v is next to a sample cluster, uh, we simply let that sample cluster engulf v. Uh, so we create a larger cluster that includes v now. And every other brown edge that is coming out of v uh, sort of survives to 
the next iteration. Uh, and in case two, if v is not adjacent to any sample cluster, in that case, we actually add all the edges from v to the other clusters to our spanner. Uh, so the first case, it's actually easy to see why the number of edges that we add is small, because we're only adding at most one edge per vertex. Uh, but actually, even in case two, we can sort of bound the number of edges, because if the degree of v in terms of how many clusters is connected to was very, very high, then it would be very unlikely that v was not adjacent to any sample clusters. Therefore, the degree of v in terms of the number of clusters adjacent to must be low. Specifically, it should be O of n to the 1 over k with high probability. Uh, and this just comes from the fact that this is the, the inverse of the probability of sampling a cluster. Uh, so reiterate, uh, v must have not low degree, but at least should be adjacent to a small number of clusters, which allows us to connect, uh, connect it to every adjacent cluster. So now I'll actually talk about these brown edges that survive to the next iteration of the algorithm. So the brown edges are all the edges in case one that were uh, not deleted and they were not added to the spanner. Uh, so we were considering the, the sample cluster uh, and notice that it's connected to a bunch of green clusters that were not sampled. Um, and so the vertex V uh, could be somewhere here, which resulted in all these uh, yellow edges being added to the spanner. The other case is that the vertex V is over here. And uh, to illustrate this, maybe I'll, maybe I'll modify case one a little bit. So let's say that uh, this vertex in case one uh, also becomes part of a sample cluster uh, through some through the process that involves that particular vertex. And now the edges between these sample clusters, the brown edges, uh, they can actually survive to the next iteration uh, because they were not deleted or added to the spanner from either end. So another thing I'm trying to convince you here is that the spanner has this internal structure that is like a tree. Uh, and every time a spanner grows, uh, the tree, the depth of the tree increases by one unit. So it grows one unit to engulf all its neighboring clusters. Um, meanwhile, some spanners, some sorry, some clusters can stop being clusters so, uh, because they were no longer sampled. Um, but the clusters that are sampled sort of grow uh, as trees, and they may have edges between their endpoints. So quickly to recap the analysis of the size of the spanner. Uh, so case one only adds O of n edges, which is fine. And then case two adds uh, a number of edges that is the number of vertices multiplied by n to the 1 over k, which is sort of the expected degree. Uh, and over the k iterations, we add the k times n to the minus 1 over k edges. There are ways to get rid of this factor of k, but uh, we won't bother with that. So one question is, why do we do this process for k iterations? Uh, one reason I mentioned earlier is because after k minus 1 iterations, the number of remaining clusters is exactly what we need to finally connect every remaining vertex to every remaining cluster. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that uh, we run for k minus 1 iterations. The other reason is because of the deleted edges, so what we do with them. So we've already considered one kind of edge deletion, where a vertex V is connected to the same green cluster uh, with multiple edges, so four in this case, and we keep only one of those edges. And the reason it's okay to do that is if you consider one of these deleted edges uh, coming from V, uh, we can replace that deleted edge with a path that includes some edges that are within the cluster, and uh, finally also using the one edge that we did did not delete between V and the green cluster. Uh, and this results in a stretch of two times the radius plus one, where the radius refers to the radius of the green cluster. Uh, there's also another kind of edge deletion that uh, deals with uh, edges between vertices that are within the same sample clusters, the same red clusters. If you, if you have an edge going between two nodes, you can safely delete that node and replace it by a similar path uh, that is going through the cluster edges. Uh, in general, we basically say that for every deleted edge, we have this replacement path, and we can compose all of these edges together to obtain the same result for any given path in the graph. So now we'll move on to talking about uh, our new results in comparison to Baswan Sen. Baswan Sen takes O of k parallel depth because every iteration depends on the previous one. Uh, on the other hand, we get sort of worse stretch bounds but our parallel runtimes are much faster. So this is our general result, but it's a little hard to parse. So instead, let's compare it to Baswana Sen, which is up here. So we can get O of k stretch using k to the 1 third, or really k to the 1 over any constant number of rounds. We can also get k to the 1 plus little o of 1 stretch uh, using polylogarithmically many rounds. And finally, we can get, uh, if you want to restrict ourselves to only log k rounds, then we can get a stretch of k to the log 3. Recall here that uh, k is less than log n, so this is log log n rounds just are lower. 
And this is the result we'll essentially be focusing on for the rest of the talk. Uh, in general, our bounds are parameterized by this quantity t, so we can get a whole spectrum of algorithms that achieve different trade-offs between the number of rounds and the obtained stretch of the spanner. But basically, so then remember that this was the algorithm I left out the last step. Uh, but uh, our goal is to basically speed up the second step, right? So this is where all the magic is happening. Uh, and the way we're going to do that is by sort of like doing two things. Uh, I would say one is more aggressive sampling, which means oops, this, okay. so more aggressive sampling uh, just means that, so this is sort of like speeding up this step. Uh, more aggressive sampling means that you want P to decrease. So let's say that the value of P should go down. Uh, so you're reducing the number of clusters faster than you were in Maswan Ascent. And as a consequence, we would expect the radius to increase faster, because if it didn't, then we are doing fewer rounds, and then we end up with a better stretch, and we've broken bounds. So some, the radius should somehow increase. We're not, I haven't really explained why yet, but this is sort of the intuitive picture of what I'm about to do. So clusters are subsamples faster, which means that you reach the end faster. So instead of using k iterations, you can do like log k or something. Cool. So let's take back a look. Take a look back at case two. So this was case two, if you remember. Uh, this is where all the edges were getting added, right? So in case two, where did the degree come from? So the degree was essentially just one over p, right? That's where the degree came from. And why was it one over p? It was because, like, otherwise there would be some red, uh, there would be some red element among these, and that's not what we have. So this is one over p, and then this is the number of vertices divided by p. Okay. So the constraint is that if we want to decrease the value of p. We had better make sure that the that this value is also decreasing, which seems very strange because the number of vertices is not actually changing in the graph. Um, so what can we actually do? So the question becomes then, you know, how do you reduce uh, reduce this value of the, this, the number of vertices in consideration? Uh, and the key sort of like reason we can do this is sort of this uh, this insight that the edges that survive. Uh, the brown edges, like the edges that will be processed in the next iteration. That they, we don't care about any. Like the, the orange edges have already been added to the spanner, and some of the edges have already been deleted. Uh, so what we care about is the brown edges, which will be sort of determine uh, what we do in the next iteration. Those are only between sample clusters, and this is not something that I've actually proved, and it's not even proved in. The, it's not even claimed in the original Boswana set paper, as far as I know. I'm not sure why. Uh, it's, I would say a little bit subtle that this claim that this is actually true, but uh, just believe me for now that like if you the, the graph actually looks like what I drew down here. So it's a bunch of bunch of red clusters, like the current level clusters, joined by brown edges. And the big idea is to just contract these clusters. You contract the clusters into vertices, and you obtain a new graph. So for example, this thing above would just become this graph below. I guess I missed one edge, so there should be. Oh. Another thing to quickly mention is that we, so in this step, we're actually deleting a bunch of edges. And that is OK, because for example, let's say uh, this is the only edge that we are keeping between two, these two clusters, um, which means that we are deleting some gray edge like this. But as before, the gray edge can be replaced by a path of length at most for r plus 1, where r is the radius of the clusters. As before, I'm still talking about unweighted graphs, but all of this extends to weighted graphs as well. It just needs some more details. Um, so we are allowed to delete these edges, and we can contract to create this graph. Um, so basically, that is, the, that is essentially the idea. Uh, what we do is, uh, so now let's look back at the algorithm again. So the algorithm was uh, before, so there was a sampling step and there was a growth step. Now we also add a contraction step. So before we go to the next iteration, um, we contract the current level clusters. Uh, so, and if you look at the contracted graph, the clusters actually never grow beyond radius one, uh, which is kind of weird to think about. Uh, but uh, let, let's just go through a little bit of the math and it'll be clear why this is actually better and what this actually gives us. Okay. So let us see how these four quantities evolve. So, uh, the first, I guess, really the first quantity is just a ratio that we need to maintain. So the first quantity, the V over P, is the ratio we want to maintain to the n to the 1 plus 1 over K. Uh, the second quantity is the number of vertices. The third one is the probability that we'll choose. And this is the thing that we can actually affect. Uh, and the radius will be a consequence of the above. Okay. So basically, we start with N. The first step we do is just like plus 1 as N. You take 1, you do, you do n to the power minus 1 over K, um, uh, which is fine, because V over P is exactly n to the 1 plus 1 over K. So now the next step, if we now decide to contract, okay, so now we contract here. So once we contract, now what happens is we have fewer vertices in the graph, which allows us to be more aggressive with the sampling. So we can actually pick a sampling probability something like this now. So this is a smaller number. Um, and V over P is still at the one plus one over K. Uh, 
And basically you get n to the power one, maybe I'll use a different color. Uh, yeah, use, uh, your V ends up being n to the power one minus three over K. And you keep doing this. Now your sampling probability can be even smaller, right? So now your sampling probability will be something like n to the power minus four over K. Um, and then the number of vertices can see consequently will be n to the power one minus seven over K. And hopefully now you can see a pattern. I guess I would write another one. Uh, the next one would be n to the power minus eight over K. Okay. Um, and that, that this should sort of like uh, tell you what the pattern is now. Uh, basically what is happening is that we are sort of, if you, if you look at this in the framework of Baswana Sen, uh, in Baswana Sen, this looks like n to the one minus one over k, one minus two over k, one minus three over k. Uh, so normally this would be one minus two over k. Normally this would be one minus three over k. So compared to Baswana Sen, we are actually going exponentially faster in some sense. Uh, but there is, there is a price to pay for this. Uh, however, in general, let me just write down the expression. So in general, it would be, if you go for some number of iterations, you would end up with n to the power one minus two to the power i minus one over k, something like this. Um, and just quickly to see how this goes, like if you set, so if you take n to the power one minus two to the power log k minus one by k, this is just equal to n to the power one over k. Okay? So this log k is the iteration number. And that's the number of iterations you need now. So as I promised you, I'm like showing you the log k depth algorithm that gives you a stretch of k to the power log three. Um, so that's how the, 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 the number of vertices grows. The other question is how does the stretch grow? And the stretch can basically be equated to the radius. So if you remember the two arguments that I gave you before, so one was here, I guess, the four R plus one, and the other one was uh, uh, when it was two R plus one. So basically the stretch is O of radius is something you can assume here. So because stretch is O of radius, we just want to figure out how the radius is growing. And how is the radius growing? So you can sort of see what I, I said through some like uh, representations here. So the first level clusters just are singleton vertices. The second level clusters are sort of like depth one trees. The third level clusters are a little bit weird. So it's like, what is the depth? It's like one, two, but then so there's like, there's, there's one, uh, there's still within one cluster, but then it could look like this, right? Like the second tree might be attached on its side. So, that's to the, so the, this, this value is not actually, not actually just uh, two or three, it's gonna be something like one, two, three, four, something weird. Um, and that doesn't tell you much. So let's actually look at what the recurrence looks like. So if you have, uh, if you have some, some cluster uh, that has radius R and it is getting attached to another cluster, which also has radius R uh, with some edge in between. So the radius of this new cluster is going to be what? Uh, it's gonna be, I guess, three R plus one. Um, the plus one is not so important in the recurrence. So basically what ends up happening is that the, the radius at the end of all of these is going to end up looking something like, or it's going to look up, look something like three to the power i. Uh, and so say I call it O of three to the power i. Because every time you go to the next step, uh, so which is actually where sort of, we can now see, start to see the problem here. So the, the, the exponent here, so the exponent uh, in n to the power one minus this is growing as the power of two, whereas the radius is growing as the power of three, right? So we, we want this to the power i term to be equal to k at the end, roughly, whereas we want this radius to also be equal to k, but that is not gonna happen anymore. So when the truth power i term becomes equal to, to so you know, when, when it's like true to the power log k, uh, this becomes three to the power log k, which is equal to uh, k to the power log three. So that's sort of why, so you feel like basically this is the thing that like basically by contracting the clusters, you're sort of deleting all the information that you've had about this part. Uh, and because you don't know what's going on in there, you can sort of just assume the worst case, uh, which is that the, 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 the extra radius that you're getting is actually just the diameter. So it's twice uh, what you would want it to be. Um, so that's not great because you're losing a lot in the stretch. So what the, the thing that we do, and I guess I'm pretty much out of time, but I'll briefly describe uh, what the idea is that extends to all these other regimes and actually gives us a family of algorithms parameterized by T. So you see how they have these like growth and sampling steps. So basically we don't need to keep the doing, we don't need to, need to do the contraction every time because right now what we are doing is we're sort of growing by one step and then immediately contracting and then growing by another, another step and immediately contracting and just doing this. Instead of that, uh, we can do something like this. And the contraction step only happens once in a while. So now we have a bunch of iterations in which you do contraction and sampling and growth, uh, but we also have these things called blocks. So let's hit it. Or I. Uh, 
which is the one that we call L. And then the, the bottom one is different now. So the bottom one becomes something like J is equal to one, two, T. So T is actually the number of steps that you go uh, without doing any contraction. Hopefully that makes sense. So basically you do T rounds of Baswana Sen like stuff. So you do like T iterations of Baswana Sen. So actually uh, we call these to be epochs, the outer ones, uh, and the inside ones to be uh, iterations. So you do like T iterations and then you contract. And when you do that, you sort of get the straight off that I mentioned earlier. So you can, for example, get uh, instead of K to the log three, you can get K to the power one plus the low of one. Uh, and you can do that with sort of a polylog depth, polylog in K depth. 